My name is Ravi Rampisun, and I'm the founder of Find My Fan. So what we're going to talk about today is the journey that got me from not knowing anything about the music industry to really potentially creating something that can transcend the way bands and artists generate revenue in the music industry, in a modern changing music industry. And the title of it is Building Your Passion, and it's really the journey to creating Find My Fans. So we'll just get started. So Find My Fan is a data analytics app that tracks social and streaming data for the music industry. We track a couple of things. Number one, song data, and also because we're uh, tracking song data, we can also track charts for something that doesn't really exist right now, charting music by genre and by location down to a very localized level. So it doesn't matter that maybe Rihanna is number one on Billboard's Hot 100 in the United States. You know, who's the top uh, jazz artist in Cincinnati, right? So things like that don't really exist right now, but for the first time, we'll be able to do that. The other thing we do because we, tr we track band and artist data is down to a micro level is we will be able to identify fan bases for artists uh, all around the world in all of their fan bases. See, right now, a lot of artists, they don't really understand where their fan base is coming from, where their listeners are coming from, where their likes are coming from. And it turns out they might know some, uh, but they definitely don't know all. So what that means is you can be an artist or band right now sitting where Andrew is in Cambridge, and you would be able to track all of your fan activity around, around the world, and you could find out that you are some of your fans are based in Brooklyn. From your couch, you would actually be able to book gigs in Brooklyn in a very streamlined, in a very streamlined way. And that makes everybody happy. See, the band gets to explore their fans in different parts around the world. They get to build their brand, they get to sell their products, um, and they get to generate more revenue. But the venues get something as well. They get to bring in uh, acts that already have a local following in their area and everybody's happy. So we created this whole cycle from beginning to end from using data to changing the way that revenue can be generated because in this world, you know, people don't buy CDs anymore. They don't, um, uh, the primary way to generate revenue is via booking. So this is, we think is something very important. So how did I go from not knowing anything about the music industry to understanding the system in a global way and some of the, those problems that happen from country to country, region to region, to being able to restructure how this, well, understand the structure of how things work and why it works, understand what those flaws are, and then essentially build something um, that mitigates all those flaws. This is essentially going to represent a paradigm shift. It did not start off very easily. Um, um, and I had no idea over the years this would, would happen. So let's take a, a jump back in time. So back in 2013, I was in Montreal and I was listening to a song on repeat and um, a question popped up in my mind. I had no, I had no interest in, in, in working in the music industry at all. I never even thought about it. My background has always been in data uh, and research. Um, but the question came up that, you know, why am I listening to this incredible song? But I knew in New York where I live, I would never hear this song on the radio. And that thought became an obsession over the course of weeks, months, and years. Um, this, this presentation could have easily been building an obsession. Um, and the, the question was, how does music go from being made to getting to the ear of the listener. Uh, and I could not shake it and I ignored it for so long, but it kept persisting at it. Somewhere in my mind, I believe I knew that question, how does music get to the ear of a listener? I understood that to be a marketing question and it's the essential question for every entrepreneur. How do you build a product and get it into the hands or, or, or in front of the eyes for the people that most that might be interested in, in using it. Uh, so, um, so, so for the, for the entire 2013, I was just kind of mulling that question over, not really doing anything, and it just kept persisting at it. And it went from, 
you know, somebody should really try to look into this one day. You know, it, it's, it's a very strange thing. You know, I, I wonder how this really, this really happens. By the time 2014 came along, I decided, I had made a decision. I said, you know what, maybe I'll tackle this question. I was honestly just looking for something to do a hobby. Um, and, I, and I thought I might buy a book. Then I bought a book and I started reading. And the more and more I started trying to figure out this question, um, the more intriguing it got. Um, because it became a question of really marketing and money. And that led to something very interesting that would pay off in time. Because I wasn't working for any music institution or, you know, school or record label, you know, I had, and this was just purely, uh, you know, research. I kind of got to learn the industry from the outside in, in every single facet, not just in, um, in, in a lot of times when you work in a particular industry, you're, you become a specialist and you, you become really good at that one or two things that you do. But I had you know, as it turned out, a very good, a very interesting advantage that I was looking at, you know, putting music in movies and, and, and diff looking at different markets. And, you know, I have the data background so I can look, look for trends. Um, and this was all still just a hobby. Towards the end of 2014, um, I felt really comfortable that, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this. I cannot stop myself. I'm watching every music show. Um, um, looking at every interview just to find out what this secret to becoming a successful artist is, right? That was the real thing. Like, how do you go from the bottom to the top? Um, so by the end of 2014, I stumbled, as fate would have it, I stumbled upon this course, which was the bootcamp course, um, which was um, Global Entrepreneurship uh, 101. And I was, it was something that I had never really experience before because a lot of the things that I knew I was thinking in my mind was, you know, these are all really great ideas that, that I'm having, but there was a huge disconnect between having an idea and giving yourself the tools and training and expertise to turning that idea into a reality. And that's why, you know, you know, the suite of products that you know, that MIT bootcamps put together for me really, I think, I honestly think it's like the future of entrepreneurship and training um, because it does really fill this incredible void um, uh, in, in going from, I have these ideas, which we all have to, I know what to do. I'm going to put this thing out there and it fills that gap uh, and it's the creative gap. And I think it's the, I think it's the gap that needs to be filled if you want to become an entrepreneur. So I took that course, and um, um, and I think that that was 101, and I was invited to um, um, beta test 102, and I had I had just sort of like f fell in love with this stuff. But the the caveat was I was getting really good grades in these online MOOCs, but some like I and I was feeling extremely confident that I knew so much about the music industry, you know, in just really like a year and a half, total overconfidence. But the game. Um, it usually brings you back down to earth, so, you know, um, it checks you in that way. Um, I realized something that I had no idea how to turn anything into a company or go anywhere past ideation. Um, um, so that was really a wake-up call, and I needed to kind of get my stuff together to turn whatever I was thinking into, uh, whatever I was thinking of, into even an idea or a concept for a, um, for a business. So then we go into 2005. By this time, um, it, it, it had been some time and I had made a lot of connections within you know, the music industry really around the world. Um, and I, you know, I had a pretty solid, quick reputation because I ended up um, becoming a teaching assistant, uh, assistant of a music business program. Um, and, and from there, you know, I learned things in a very different way. Um, so, so later in 2015, I did two things. Um, I created this music pilot program that was really focused on artists, singers, songwriters, and producers, and really trying to figure out if they gave me a song or they gave me something, how far I can go with it. Um, and I, I ran into a lot of different barriers because um, I, I, think, I think the music industry is, a, is it's heavily relationship-based. Um, and it's so much about hype, and hype becomes so much about marketing and money. And there we go again with that 
the idea of understanding markets. And when I use the word marketing, I don't mean advertising specifically. I mean um, the idea of understanding a target market or your brand's target market, um, um, which, which interestingly is the same journey I'm having from, from a business point of view. I need to understand my, my market with my customers. And, and the parallels between the journey that you know, a, a singer or a band or an artist takes and where they ultimately want to go to is, is identical to the path of any other entrepreneur because they are also entrepreneurs. They, um, what they produce is just a little bit different from what we do in, in the high tech world. Uh, the other thing I did um, was I created this think tank. I, I realized that I wasn't going too far. Um, the things were happening, but things weren't seeming to stick, right? It, it felt like there were sparks, but it, there wasn't this we weren't, we weren't able to accomplish everything that we were about, bound to accomplish other than learning a lot. So we created this think tank and it was, it was filled with a bunch of innovators uh, from really all around the world. Um, you know, I think it was MTV, BET, Nickelodeon, and all aspects of music um, um, and institutions too. Um, um, you know, the Ivy Leagues and, and um, I think Viacom. And there were these huge and writers at Billboard and we, we had a couple of questions. Just try to figure out what is, what is the major or what are the major barriers to becoming successful in the music industry? And this was specifically from the, the, the artist or band's point of view. And there was a couple of recurring themes, right? There goes that, uh, in a, you know, access to people because it's a relationship business and if you're creating great music in, 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 in one city that isn't totally plugged into the main hub um, you're gonna have problems so it became this siloed type of thing and adding adding to that there was such a, a saturation of music in, in the world today because it becomes so easy to make and some of them are great and some of them aren't but they but the real problems were, it, it was totally about money and, and, and advertising and being able to generate buzz. Um, that's why when you put on your radio um, or, or even the things you decide to choose to listen to when you're searching, is things that you had already heard about before. Um, and that really became this, um, you know, a celebrity culture of music that, that seemed a little bit, it's just where things are. And who knows if it's always been like that, but. It just felt that there were so many musicians out there that weren't really getting their fair share. And back to the original question I had, that great song that I heard, you know, it just didn't seem that the, it, the traction was commensurate with um, what, what I perceived like the, the financial rewards were. Um, and, and, and those things were all validated during that think tank. It still became the question of um, what do you do? Um, and that's not a business, that's just understanding problems and just knowing that that problem can be solved. Somewhere also in 2015, I had met up with um, um, a, very, a very famous artist and we decided to um, analyze his data. And it turned out that this artist, it was like a great moment for me because you know, to be in the room just two years after you started something with somebody that incredible that you had known for many years um, or had been a fan of for many years was very cool, very validating. Um, and he was shocked that he had fan bases in places that he had never been to. And I was shocked that he was shocked because I imagine that, you know, in my mind, you know, people at this level, they got to know everything. This is how they got here. But, but it was shocked that he had fans in cities and countries that he had never really been to. And I think that was one of the major, major milestone moments. I still didn't know what to do with it, but I always... I always said to myself, like this, there is something here in this data that people just don't know, even at this level. And I wonder if it'll happen at, at other levels too, even with startups. So we started analyzing kind of data for like a couple other people. And sure enough, it turns out that, you know, artists from New York, they had, um, a pres you know, they had activity in like places like Dubai and Singapore, places that they'd never thought about at all but it looked like they had, you know, substantial activity there. In addition to the places that they knew about, that they regularly toured, but that was really when I understood that data had to be a part of it. But turning that into a company was, so now we found the solution. It was a problem, massive problem. Um, found the solution, great feeling, 
Now the challenge was, okay, so then what does that mean? What does a solution, what does a company look like? What does a product look like? And I didn't know it would be tech at all. I just thought that maybe we could be some type of a consultancy that helps musicians market better. Um, but I very quickly realized that um, the customers for that, if they were a small artist, they wouldn't be able to you know, afford what these services are. Um, and two, if you're a, somebody a lot bigger, you might not take it seriously and you might not be able to show the, the, the right amount of value. So it really seemed like that was like a dead end unless I just wanted to be some type of a freelance consultant or something like that on marketing. So that wasn't good enough for me. So now we enter 2016. So I have all this knowledge, I have all these connections. I know what I think I want to do, I just don't know how to put it together. Um, so I applied for the uh, MIT Global Entrepreneurship Bootcamp in Seoul. Um, I think it was just like a couple of days before the deadline. I didn't even make up my mind to apply until a few days before. And um, I kind of raced through the application in, 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 in a few days or it might've been a week. Um, and um, I was fortunate enough to, to, to get accepted. The experience itself was, everybody says this, it, it was like transcendent. Um, um, what I said before about having all these ideas and not knowing how to really manifest them, it was, um, I believe I was able to fill so many of those holes. And, and a lot of those holes were, not just in, in, in just the sheer training and understanding how to approach your target markets and, 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 and what are the steps involved in, in, in going from A to really not B, but Z and, and knowing all of that in advance of it happening, right? They call that vision uh, and understanding where you're going, but you really need to see all the way down the line and make adjustments um, and come back to the president and make these adjustments so you know where you're, you're going. I felt like, um, that that was the thing I had always been missing, um, and I strongly I strongly recommend that if you have the opportunity to do that, you definitely should. Um, so sometime during the boot camp, I had a um, um, a uh, a roommate that happened to be an engineer at Microsoft in India, and during off hours, we I kind of just mentioned this thing I was doing to him, and I. Kind of showed him what I was thinking about doing, not knowing um, how to execute something like this. And he basically said he knew exactly how to do this. It just would take manpower um, um, and and just a little bit more thought. But you know, serendipity was that all of a sudden I'm thinking about doing something with data and analytics, and I'm paired with somebody that just understood how to execute that. Um, uh, or, or just kind of said to me that what I'm thinking about doing is not easy to um, to execute, but very doable if if the structure was there. So that was this huge thing for me. Um, and later in 2016, I ended up um, having really another aha moment just after the boot camp when I was actually visiting um, the MIT offices. Um, I I had realized that giving data, data means nothing. You know, it's just numbers on a page. Um, sure, it's nice if you want to understand analytics and what, what's going on, but for the average person, especially the average band or musician, you know, you can't expect somebody who knows how to play the guitar to understand data analytics and what to do with it, right? So the idea was um, it needs to be visually easy for a user to understand what's happening. And that's where the idea of using geolocation came in. It seems so simple looking back now, but it, it, that hadn't really been done. I know people are doing geolocations in different industries now, but that wasn't really a new thing a couple of years ago. Um, that was a new thing a couple of years ago, but the idea we can combine all this social and streaming analytics and, 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 and basically put it on a map for every artist um, automatically so they can actually see stuff and understand what that means was, um, was, was a really powerful thing 
and uh, ended up launching the concept, just the concept of the Inter-American Development Bank um, at a 30 under 30 event in, um, in Washington, D.C. that year. And I didn't know what to expect, but um, it, it was received it was received very well because one of the other things that we talked about um, and I didn't touch on is, is, is this idea that you can use music analytics to target um, um, micro market beyond the music industry, right? Um, and, and, and that was the vision. It was, it was really about really under re, a, a reimagining how marketing can work for different people. Um, and, and we think that's where my marketing is going. It's micro markets. And we could, we, we'd be able to do that in a very short order after um, we've launched. So that goes us to, to 2016. Still no product. And now it's been over three years since I've had this quote. And even at this point, it was already, I, I felt like I was living a dream um, just because I was chasing this thing um, that I didn't know what I was really chasing. But I like chasing it. And, um, and let's get into now 2017. So in 2017, we have all this background, you know, um, you know, there's plenty of people that understand this. We have access to different entrepreneurship networks and all that. Um, now it was time to, okay, so we have this idea. Let's put out a little prototype and see if the actual target market, market the musician or the bands who have different varying levels of tech understanding, understand why this is important. And let's show it to them. So we would just kind of show people, hey, this is what you can do based on on um, what we're working on. It's going to be based on your data, so it's, it's 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 uniquely already yours. We're just presenting it in a different way. And when I knew that that we had something, I knew we had something. But when I saw the expression on just about everybody's face, it was number one awe. Number two, no, this doesn't really exist, right? Does it? And um, that was generally the, the, the overwhelming response. And they started saying how they would be able to use this as well. So that was very encouraging. And it was just a matter of now following through. So last year, we did a lot of business planning, you know, for laying the foundations for, um, uh, uh, for 2018, uh, understanding what the right marketing strategy would be. Because this is important in, in advance because you don't want to launch something and have it just not take off, right? Because you kill all your momentum. So we started doing some more media and really building a lot of traction um, um, within different constituencies, not just in the music industry, not just with media in different countries, um, um, but with the people that might actually be using this and keep, and, and really trying to um, add on different pieces to the puzzle. And then in, in 2018, we did a little bit more iteration and that's when the bookings came in. So if we're already finding out you're big in Dubai, it makes a whole lot of sense to be able to submit songs to from wherever you are to the type of media that would play your music in these different locations because if not you're not you can now can be justified that people are already listening to you, just not on the radio. Radio is still a really massive medium. Uh, and in different countries it's it's not even close. Um, not always the same in the US, um, but, but still a massive, massive medium. And it really has a very high barrier to entry, um, unlike the digital world. So it is also about um, prestige and, and, and validation as well. And the other thing you would be able to do that we added in, in 2018 in the iteration process was being able to now um, create a system where you can actually generate revenue by um, booking with locations um, from anywhere you are to anywhere else. And we expect um, this version to be launched in uh, 20, um, later this year in uh, November 17, 20. Ravi, if I can interrupt you for a second, I think it's really significant uh -huh. for you to share a little bit about, you know, why this is so important to the music industry segment you're targeting. Um, can you yeah. explain a little bit more about you know, you're not trying to boil the ocean. You're not trying to, sure. um, you know, target the entire spectrum of the music industry. But can you talk about the specific segments, you know, from the, from, from the song that you were listening to, uh, where, uh, where and why this was so important to the particular segment? Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, so, so our segments have, so there's a few segments that we look at where we're settling 
on now is the idea that so this is this is you know a tech product and um people uh, of a certain age they're and of a certain success level uh they have a way of doing things because they've been you know music industry is a thing that um you start off very young um and and you're trained very young our target audience is an under 25 crowd that has say, savvy and it's it's really skews more towards um under 20 and it's the idea that we are willing to shape the next generation of how people um who create music can generate income right so you're talking about the music school the people are in music schools and, and different music programs we want to be able to not maybe this is the wrong word but indoctrinate them or introduce them into a system of of after they've produced their music and after they have put it out there this is the path you use to generate revenue um because it's simple and streamlined and it's also a time saving thing because you don't necessarily now need to um tour in locations where they don't know or don't like you um um or you can you can you can be more selective in where you go and how you promote and how they eat themselves understand who their target market is right so we think this is a um a next generation of 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 music industry tool and the thing about music generations is they happen really only over the course of every few years it's not it's not the typical generation. So every five or six years, things change. So we think in the next few years, once we launch, we'd be able to influence a lot of the young people that are coming through these music institutions. And they're fairly easy to get to these things, these, these people. And of course, we'll take anybody else. We, we think this, we, we think based on the, um, based on the feedback that we've gotten with, with artists young and old, um, we think there's going to be a large networking effect to this because it's, it's just there's just a cool factor to just seeing your foot, your digital footprint for the first time. And even if you're, look, even if you're Rihanna, um, she doesn't know what that looks like. And it's, you know, if she saw a map of where she was, where her music was played and covered and was put right in front of her face, that's not just something on a phone. That's essentially her fingerprint on the world. Um, so even so, even from a cool standpoint, I think a lot of people would be interested in this. But our target market has to remain uh, um, uh, to fairly youthful. Is that does that answer the question, Andrew? And that's changed over time. But we think that in terms of in terms of in terms of immediate goals, that has to be number one because we think that's a, a very easy place to get to. The other part about that is you know you also have to. It isn't just about immediate target market. Like right? what's the right target market? It's also about the team in place, right? So the team in place that, that we have, we have um, very strong relationships within the Caribbean, um, Jamaica and Trinidad, and 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 also like the underground in New York with, within the hip hop industry and and and, and access to different um, subgenres in different places around the world. So we feel that it's fairly easy uh, with just some media and 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 some. Um, and some um, uh, and some patients, we think we can fairly e easily tackle some of those uh, strongholds we have just based on relationships. So there's a two prong approach, but we definitely have to focus on um, um, what we're good at. Number one, where we're connected in, and also what what's easy. Absolutely. So I would also, you know, add, um, you know, it's a data driven world now, and uh, yes, it's great to see where your uh, digital digital footprint, your fans are, but also I think, um, you know, it's also about evidence-based targeting. How do you break into new markets, sure. um, locations that you're currently not reaching? And so that's probably going to be significant, but hey, you know, you should continue your story and and we, we can uh, keep the questions coming to the end. So just... A uh, small housekeeping reminder, um, you're probably watching this and thinking about all these percolating questions in your head. Um, I would encourage you to use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. There's a small button. Click on the Q&A box and, and write your questions in there and, and we'll, we'll get to them uh, very, very shortly. So Ravi, please continue. 
Okay, so this is going to be my favorite slide. So that's that's what we anticipate for 2018 and beyond. We think we think things are going to be very interesting. And this has already been like a, an incredible, incredible journey. Not just um, not just the idea of going from knowing nothing to being able to do something big, but really, you know, it's it's really more of a personal journey, right? How do you keep pulling on a string and, and seeing where that string leads you to? And it's already led me around the world and and uh, really, you know, mentally matured in, in, in a way that um, it's very different than what I was before. So this is, this is my favorite slide. So okay, so the key lessons learned, right? Um, it's really, really, really important to follow the things that intrigue and excite you. If you're really trying to figure out what you should be doing and what you might be willing to spend five or 10 or 15 years of your life on, especially if you're um, you're, you're in the prime of your life, like I feel like I am, you know, I'm essentially dedicating um, um, my prime to, towards developing this, and I already have been. Um, so if you don't know where to start, um, at least you're looking, that's what probably brought you on, onto this webinar, but you should probably look back at your life and kind of think about what are the things that excite you? Um, what are the things that make you, you know, make you curious? I think the the solutions can be found there, um, and and that's exactly the path that I followed. And 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 you know, it was a recurring question, and it did not start um, any other way. That's exactly how it started, and I just kept pulling at it, and I ended up here. Um, and 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 as I look back on things, I realized that I had always been in the music community, man. I I I knew a lot of people in, in the music industry with DJs, promoters, clubs, and venues, and it just and for 20 years since I was since I was. Um, since I was a teenager, so it just seems very, um, um, you know, like the light bulb goes up. Oh, this is what I probably should have been doing, though it wasn't an, an instrument, and I've never played an instrument. Everybody asks me that because that's usually the pathway into this. No, I never have. Um, and the other thing that's really, really, really important is there's only one you, um, and in most cases, you don't even know who the real you is. Um, and it's really important to find that who, who that person is. And I think as you as you follow along. A journey, whatever it is, um, uh, you follow your passion. You'll figure out who that person is really quickly, um, and it's up to you to decide if what parts of that person you like and what parts of that person you don't like. And you keep things that you like, and you get rid of the the things that that you don't. There is, and it's also be bold, which happens to be um, the the motto of the organization I work for called the Roush Foundation, uh, which I'm here right now. Um, it's I, I remember the first time I acted super bold in this. Um, in, the, in this journey, I, this is before I even put pen to paper. And it was uh, the first thing I did, uh, even before buying a book in 2014, that happened to the, the, the biggest independent record label in the world, I believe, it's just really, it's called VP Records. And it's, you know, just a couple of miles from my house. And I must have passed this, this place like a thousand times in my life without going in. And I said one day, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to walk into that place and just ask to speak to somebody. And it seemed ridiculous at the time. And now I would I have no problems doing that. But I don't think I'd ever really done something like that before. Just walk in and, and, and just say, I want to talk to somebody about music. And of course, I had no reason to do that because I knew nothing at the time. Uh, and, you know, the funny thing that happened was I just left my number with the, you know, it was a little old lady up front and she got back to me with, um, somebody that was like a high level consultant with the company and he and I were talking, um, ended up talking for, for a long while, uh, a few times. Um, but that led, and I'm going to jump down a little bit, but that led to a very interesting aha moment for me because I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I didn't know anything about what I could be doing. The only reason I went to a record label is because that was the word I knew. I knew what a record label kind of was. And that was the word that resonated with me. So of course, why not start the record label? Um, there was nothing more complex than that. It, it, there was not a lot of analytics involved in that decision, put it like that. And um, that led to, to a moment that I now realized was like a really um, interesting point for me in my, my development was that he kept being like, th he thought I was like very cool. And I know I wanted to do something. And he kept asking me something. He was just like, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I'll do it. And it made me realize, only recently I realized this was, that's the real big shift, right? The real big shift is being able to turn yourself. I didn't know what to tell him to do because I had nothing, you know? I didn't know, I didn't have this plan or anything like that. And I couldn't tell him what to do. Um, but I realized that that was the real, the real journey here is the idea that you can become somebody that, that can be told what to do 
to becoming the person that understands a vision and tells what everybody else needs to do. Because, and that's the real journey, right? It's go, how do you go from the person that's a specialist or, or knows their job function to the person that understands the entire system and is able to delegate work? And that's the real journey. And that's, um, and that's what you, you have to become if you wanna be an entrepreneur or even a co-founder. Um, you, you know, you need to be able to lead and, and that's the, that's the, that's what's lacking. And that's what most entrepreneurs have is being able to lead in some way. Um, you've heard the next one before, fail off in trial and error. And of course, just don't think you have to, you have to be able to execute. Um, that means, you know, analysis paralysis is, is a big thing, but to me, that's a byproduct of fear, fear of failure, fear of success is a big one too. Um, um, and it doesn't come off as just being terrified by stuff. It comes off as, you know, being lazy or being, um, um, you know, procrastinating, which is, which is a big thing as well that you have to fight through. Um, very important, you do a SWOT analysis on yourself. Um, strengths Can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Can you talk a little bit about how you push through those issues? Um, okay. Procrastination um, is like you're paralyzed because like, crap, there's so many choices. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about all those? Okay, I'll try. I don't know that I've thought. Okay, let's, let's see. Let me give it a shot. Yeah, so you're paralyzed by, if you can, if you're standing in the middle of a circle, you have 360 degrees to go, right? And the more you kind of start walking your path, you know, that, you, you know, your direction starts to kind of narrow a little bit. So you have a generalized direction of where you should go, right? Um, but I think, number one, you have to keep moving and you have to keep learning and keep building, right? In some fashion, it doesn't have to be linear, um, and it doesn't have to be always pen and paper and constantly thinking. You can constantly learn, and that's a form of moving forward. Um, but it is, uh, I saw, I think it was a TED Talk. They were talking about who the real successful entrepreneurs at and really successful companies um, are. And, you know, one thing just always kind of popped up, and they decided that the real key ingredient in success, in success is something called grit. Excuse me. And the idea that you can kind of push through things. Um, um, and I think that gets very hard if you're doing something that you really don't like um, or, or you're trying to force something um, that you really shouldn't be forcing. You know, everybody's trying to get into blockchain for, for some reason and buy Bitcoin and all that. But, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do something in an area that you don't have the experience or um, and you're not willing to, to love it, um, you're gonna have a lot of problems with procrastination. Like for me, when I, you know, there were times there that I didn't do something for like a whole month because I just felt like overworked and overloaded. Not, not, not physically, but, but mentally exhausted. And it was burnout through this process because it really does take a toll on your mind. And, some, and, and procrastination and rest are two different things, right? So sometimes you just definitely need to rest your mind. Um, but but there, there is no real answer for the original question. Um, um, Andrew, but, but just, it's, you know, because it comes down to will and you'll have, a, you'll find that you'll build a lot of will if you actually really enjoy what you're doing. And, and, and that kind of makes things a lot easier and, and just pushing through becomes a lot easier. And I think that's, I think that that's the method that if I look back, that's what I did. But the, also the other thing is you have to understand what fear is and how it manifests in your life. So I think I think when you procrastinate, you have to really look at what the reasons you're procrastinating for, and and it could be you know um, tired, being tired. Um, it could be just it's so close that oh my God, this is about to happen, or you you know you could just be over overwhelmed and and, and, and you know um, so there could be a multiple amounts of reasons. Does that make sense? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so, so the other thing is, so the SWOT analysis I was talking about is really, um, it's really, uh, really identifying your personal strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and really taking a really good hard look at yourself and what you're good at and what you're not. Um, and it is a really good way of identifying if you're good at doing SWOT analysis. If you can, if you can't identify something that you're really horrible at, um, um, then you're you probably and you think you're strong at everything you're probably a little bit delusional here and you might want to ask your friends and, and be receptive to what they say because that'll make you um, um, 
a, a really a better person, number one. Uh, but number two, all these lessons um, and, and all this work that's being done early on sets the foundation for decision making later on. Um, when things really matter, when there's a lot of money at stake, when there's decisions that need to be made and you're the only one that needs to know how to make them, it really does provide for reference points for doing the things that you said you're going to do. And uh, the other thing is ignore time frames early on because you just don't know. You don't know. You can, you can put some nice time frames just to keep yourself on, on track, but you can't really get down on yourself for not making these time frames because in the beginning, you just don't really know as much. Um, and um, so how, if you don't have all the, 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 the pieces to the puzzle, how can you accurately put together a time frame? So that's, a, that's one thing to keep yourself uplifted because this process is really hard and it's full of really high ups and really low downs. The cool thing about it is the ups don't seem as high after a while and the lows don't seem low. It just, it just feels like it's just another day. Um, um, and it makes you a little bit unflappable to be honest with you. Um, um, and, and I talked about the aha moments and that, uh, with that, I want to talk about some book res recommendations for everybody in here. Um, the, the Disciplined Entrepreneurship book by Bill Ouellette, um, that's, that's, that's an incredible book, The 24 Steps to really, it, it, what it does is it helps create a framework for you to navigate going from thinking ideation to building something close, a prototype or something close to it, which is massive. Um, and I use it as a reference manual. I still, I still do just to make sure that there's the things that I'm missing or I could do better. There's another book called All You Can Eat. Um, that takes, it's really, that's more about financials and accounting, but it really takes you through how do you now set up a company and run a company that's financially um, um, feasible. Uh, and you need to know that stuff as well, or you need to have somebody in your team that, that knows that stuff. Um, I am a big fan of the CEO knowing a little bit of everything, just because you need to have a foundational knowledge of everything. If you, if it's your business, you got to know every part of it. Um, there's a book by Illuminate that was gifted to me um, that talks about storytelling, and your narrative is very important, not from a personal standpoint, but from, from how you convey a story. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here talking for 40 minutes, um, but, you know, when you have to give a presentation, you know, sometimes it's just a couple of minutes you have to create, you have to condense your complex thoughts and rationality into very much a simple, here's the problem, here's the solution, um, this is what we're doing, um, um, this is why it's important um, kind of way, and, and, and storytelling is very good. And I always recommend the Bhagavad Gita because you could read that book and you read a couple of things. You might understand the universe now. Um, um, and those are really important. So from that, you can kind of build your, you know, these four books, you can help build yourself. Um, ideate and, and prototype a company, launch a company, and, and, and tell your story um, all in one. And, and there's a few other great ones, but I think these are the ones that probably influenced me um, a, a very great deal. Here is my contact information. Uh, you can just reach me, Rob Ramsey, soon on all forms of social media. Send me an email. Visit the website. Um, I look forward to any questions that you uh, might have or or are interested in asking. Feel free. I will definitely respond to you. Easier to get uh, to me on Instagram um, or email. That's it. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, perfect. I didn't even have to say stop the uh, screen share because I did it. Man. <laughs> Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, okay, I have a few questions for myself too. Okay. Um, you spoke a lot about the, uh, the issue of value chain um, from creation all the way to the customer and your listener. Um, and I, I think that's a really big issue. You know, the, the big issue here is very often we don't really understand those value chains and and can you share a little bit about you know i guess from my perspective you know we had always talked about um music um because you were already in that state but can you share a little bit more about your professional background you talked a little bit about data you talked a little bit about analytics but what did you actually do before you get you got into this whole sure. 
innovation journey and discovery of self-actualization and, and all that? So, okay, so I, and I'm here right now. Um, um, so I work up until next week uh, when I focus on Find My Fans totally, uh, full time, very exciting. Um, um, so I work at an organization on Long Island called the Roush Foundation. One of the, one of the projects that, uh, that we put out is something called the Long Island Index Report, which is essentially the region's uh, premier and only data, data gathering resource. And we've been doing that for 15 years. And as part of that, we conducted research that had never been done before and also put together um, digital and tech tools that allows for communicating that information in a very digestible way. The way I say that, and the way I talk about Find My Fans, you see it's really the same thing, except that now I'm putting this all into, and we've, over, of course, done interactive maps. Now I'm just taking a lot of those lessons learned, applying it to a field that I've been working in, which is the music industry, that has generates massive amounts of data that's, that goes unused and, and unutilized, and putting it together in, in, in just really... Um, um, not just an app, but a, a company, right? Because an app is just, you know, a thing, you know, you have to build a company around that. And I want to say one other thing. Um, so we use the word app, we use the word tech, we, we use different entrepreneurship. The real, as I've come to figure out, system design, and I've read this somewhere, the real value is understanding systems and redesigning systems. Once you can do that or build that skill set, um, which is kind of what we do here anyway, um, then you, it's very easy for you to identify what the solutions are and then build to that solution. That's the, finding the solution is not enough. Then you now have to figure something else out, which is how do you build something that now capitalizes on that solution that you're, 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 you're proposing. Okay, so would it be, then be fair to say that you already had been developing this expertise for a while and then you had these uh this burning question a recurring question in your head and so uh, that that kind of leads me to uh another a question we have here from paula that says so what happens if you don't have just one recurring question what happens if you have many questions. How do you choose? Um, oh boy. Um, the kind of question that I was talking about was one that just kind of just was a scratch that I needed to itch. And the more I ignored it, the more it scratched. So I, I started pulling on that string. So as just react, just because I wanted it to stop. So that's, that's the type of question I'm talking about. These are more obsessive thoughts as I look back on it, man. Um, so, so I think you need to explore. So if you're at that point where you're still in discovery mode, discover. Um, there were many years that I went through volunteering and, 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 and trying to figure things out, even going to different classes and all that. So if that's where she is, Paula is in her journey, you have to pull on all those things because um, it's, it could be informing you to something that you might need for the future, right? And I think you need to, and you don't know where those things go. You know, I didn't know five years ago I'd be sitting here with you, Andrew. Um, um, and, uh, but I'm glad that I am. Um, but I think that's just reflective of the place that somebody's in. And I've been there, you've been there, and we've all been there. And you need to start figuring out how do you start answering all of those questions. And the thing that you gravitate the most to is going to be a very strong indicator to you that you need to 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 approach one and not the other because you get interested in things that last for two months or three months and six months but some things tend to stick with you and i encourage people to look at their past to see you know what are the things that they've always kind of liked to do and they haven't really figured that out and that's a really strong indicator that you might be very well suited in a particular industry. Now, what you might do in that industry is, is very different. You know, like I, people say, I'm in the music industry. Well, I'm not really in the music in, in industry anymore, right? I'm in entrepreneurship. And, and I target the music industry as, as, as my customer, but we're really in location intelligence and data, right? So it's really this hybrid. Um, so you're, it's a very interesting uh, switch there, you, what, what, what you just did. You said, um, your customers are in the music music industry, mm -hmm. but your core competency and your core product really is in location intelligence. That's right. That's right. You know, you you know, if you join the military, you don't just have to be a sniper, right? You can you can 
you know, you can be a, you know, a graphic designer, you know, so the industry and the expertise, they don't have to line up. Um, I, I had a friend once tell me he was so passionate about, you know, leverage finance. And I'm like, how do you even be passionate about leverage finance? That makes no sense. But, but you need to really figure out what you really like. And maybe he really liked working in banking. But what were you passionate about? What did you want to do in that industry? Right. So there's already often two separate things, industry and, and what you want to do within that industry. Exciting. Um, Taylor is asking, what advice do you have on navigating the process for transitioning for, from employee to entrepreneur? Financially, when did you know it was the right time to pull the trigger? Ah, uh, so two part question, like, okay, so the advice, the advice on how do you go from, uh, employee to, to management, like how do you flip that, right? Well, number one, uh, by the way, you'll know, um, and I'll tell you how, but you need to build your education and training helps, and that doesn't mean formal, you know, um, Google has a lot of resources, edX, there's so many different, um, very um, um, affordable ways for you to build your expertise in whatever you're trying to build your expertise in. That doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, so you need to build your expertise. Uh, you need to become really an expert in your field and, and you'll know that nobody just calls you and just says, hey, you're an expert in this field, right? But you'll know, you, you, you'll get these indications by the way, who's calling you and asking you what, right? Uh, it isn't always clear when you become an expert, in other words, um, but you can, you can really start assessing when people start looking at you to answer questions. And that is your indicator that you are now in a leadership position, whether you know it or not. So that's usually a really good time, but you have to build the expertise, right? I mean, and, and, and at some point you'll have the confidence to step into that leadership. And it doesn't ha happen right away, right? You know, I, I remember a story that, you know, I was sitting in on the meeting and um, I, I was still calling myself the new guy in the room and there were like tons of experts in there. And I left with a friend of mine um, and, and I was like, well, you know, I know I'm still the, the, the new guy. And he was like, what are you talking about, man? You, you ran that meeting. And I was like, really? So you'll have these moments where, you know, it seems that who you feel you are, well, you've already shed that skin and you're now something else. Um, so, it be, but, but you have to look to these cues, you know, you're not going to get an email from, from me telling you you're a leader in this now. Um, and you just have to kind of know now when it comes to like, um, like, pursuing something full-time, um, there's no answer for that, to be honest with you. It, it either feels right or it doesn't. Circumstances might force you into, into doing that if, if it's you. You know, some people, um, they've had very bad experiences, but to me, it's, it's not really bad. It's just maybe, maybe that's the time to do it, but you have to take a leap. The, the point, you would eventually have to take a leap if you're serious about it. Can you share a little bit more about what was your thinking in terms of the timing for planning this transition? So um, I have to tell you that I, I'll go back to the timeline slide. I always thought this would have happened like years ago. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm glad it didn't because now I get so many more years of experience and understanding and friendships uh, and, you know, expertise and you get meter coverage and all that that helps with momentum for when you launch. Um, so, so I, that's a really good question. So I knew that I would be like, basically the end of April would be my last days here from two years ago. Right. So that kind of was like, so, so, so for over the last, I know, maybe it might've been a year and a half ago. So I understood that this transition was coming, right? Because we were moving an asset that I did research for over to another company. So I had this date in mind anyway to kind of sort of prepare. This was kind of done for me. So I knew what I had to do from that point to this point uh, and then get ready to now um, push for the final launch and we think it's gonna be good. So for me, in my particular case, it happened really um, organically and well and I planned around that um, um, because you don't, because I had been doing a lot. It's essentially at some point you're working two, two full-time jobs on, on your entrepreneurship venture and your full-time job. And by the way, nobody out there be afraid of that. If you like what you're doing, you'll, you'll, you'll figure out that you like, you'll really like it. It's not going to feel like work. Um, if you're smiling a lot, you, a lot, you're on the right path. Um, so for me, it was a, a lot easier and I got a schedule that I had to plan for. 
Okay, so it kind of happened, you know, um, concurrently as as yeah, okay, serendipitously. Yeah. yeah, right. I was looking for that word. Thank you. Yeah. Um, by happenstance. So another person, Panchaya, um, I believe she was at the most recent boot camp. Hey. <laughs> and so, so now she's asking uh, the same questions you were asking when you had, uh, you know, just come out boot camp. And, and so, you know, and, and I'm going to go back to the uh, comment you made about the roommate that you're staying with. Who was that, by the way, uh, from India? And, oh, um, Akshay. Oh, right, right, right. And, and then the next question, uh, sort of a follow-up question was, is it possible for team members to work from different countries? Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, so... In and maybe share broad, your experience. Uh, in broad terms, I'm sorry, go ahead. Maybe share your experience about, um, you know, uh, have yeah. you had people working uh, together in a team with you from different countries and, and what did you do to help facilitate and accommodate that process so they could be as efficient as possible? Um, how, how could it be as efficient as possible? It's going to be hard for me to answer. But I will talk about some of the problems that I know exist, right? It's time zones, number one. Um, so when you're, you know, it's either somebody's just rolled out of bed to wet when you're sleepy and you're ready to go to sleep um, and to try to be highly functioning at those points, that's very difficult to do. Um, you need, I mean, there's a lot of different tools out there that allows for, um, for co-working on projects. You know, Slack people use a lot, so, you know, um, it does it does expand the time that it takes to get responses however if you're at a startup that's pre-funded and you're not on anybody's time limits um i think that's fine because you want to get something better out there than um uh, so, so that it matters less um you don't have to really be uh, on call with each other um it, it, it it's difficult and everybody needs to find uh, the right rhythm it, it's, it becomes a little bit easier if the, 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 the two or three or four, whatever, how many amount of people are working on separate different things. So if somebody's working on the development side and somebody's working on the marketing side, well, that's okay. You don't really need to connect all the time and that, that person can lead their own division. It comes a little bit harder if you're working with a marketing person um, across the world and you have to kind of be in sync with each other all the time. So I would kind of suggest that, you know, if that has to be the case, Make sure, to the best of your ability, the uh, the job functions are 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 different across different countries, um, um, not within the same job function. That would be the advice. Yeah, um, and so Chelsea also asks. Um, we're about a minute and a half left, but Chelsea also asks, um, what do you think stood out most on your bootcamp application and? What do you think set you apart from the other candidates? Andrew, that's a question for you to, you to answer, man. <laughs> no, hey. Well, uh, I think, I, okay, so I think, I think um, I didn't have tons of confidence in, because in, I didn't know, like, if I was going to be accepted. I know this was this uh, hyper-exclusive thing. Um, um, and just for people out there, Andrew and I kind of knew each other beforehand, all right? And before, even before you, you were at MIT. Um, but I thought, I said, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to say everything I wanted to do. And here's the logic. I don't know. I don't, I don't care how it's going to work, but I know this is logical. This is going to work. It's an idea. I'm just going to put it on paper. And, and I have a really strong background, I thought, in what I was talking about. And I said, you know what? Um, once there's passion in there, here's that word again. I think that comes off the page. Um, um, and, and people can read something about it. You can read somebody's tone when you're reading an application. I know I do. Um, and I, and I think that's really important. So you could always tell when somebody's holding back and when they're not. And I, I don't think I'm not a fan of holding back. Yes. And that is why <laughs> we ask for video introductions right. because we can see your face. We can see your level of passion for what you want to do. Um, and so Rama Lingam is asking, can you, Ravi, share the uh, authors of uh, All You Can Eat and Illuminate as their multiple books? Sure. All You Can Eat is by Kevin Howell, who's a good friend of mine. Um, and um, Illuminate is actually by Nancy Duarte and Patty Sanchez. And they're the ones that kind of 
it's a very famous book. They're very famous authors. Fantastic. Well, uh, Ravi, such a pleasure to have you on the MIT Global Innovator Series all today. All mine, all mine. Thank you so um, much. I'm very excited about your next steps and I want to wish you the best. Thank you for this, uh, for taking the time to learn and be inspired with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.